Welcome, everybody. This is Hugh Massey, the chairman and founder of DNA Behaviour International. And today I'm delighted to be hosting another one of our identity conversations. And with me is Rosemary Murphy, and she works with uh, Columbia Threadneedle, and she is the uh, leader of training and development for uh, Columbia Threadneedle and has been working with us uh, uh, with DNA behaviour for the last five or six years and uh, a, a great advocate for uh, the, the work we do um, and, and having it embedded a, a, across Columbia Threadneedle. So welcome, Rosemary. Thank you. It's great to be here. So, Rosemary, why don't you just tell me and, and, and our audience a little bit about you know, your life and career background and, and how you got to uh, this great position in, in running learning and development at Columbia Threadneedle? Sure. So my route to Columbia Threadneedle was not a straight line. Um, I started my career after college as a caterer, as an off-premise caterer. And I it was after a college seminar. I ran home to my boyfriend and said, I want to work at this company and I want to run weddings and fancy parties for corporations. So I ended up working there for 10 years. And then one day I was on the beach with a cousin who worked at another financial firm called MFS Investment Management. He asked me about my job. I said, you know, I love my job, but I am I need to do something new now. It's some time for me to do something new. So he said, well, what is it that you want to do? And I said, I'd like to plan and run events for a big company. And he said, well, we have that. So about three weeks later, I was working at MFS Investment Management as an event planner. And I, I did the event planner role for about 10, uh, 10 months or so. But as I was um, sitting outside the event door, you know, the conference doors, I was more interested in being in the conference and learning about um, investments and the firm and our clients than I was checking people in to the conference. So I talked to the director of learning and development at the time, his name was John, asked him how he got into his his job. He told me about his background. And then about a month or so later, he called and said there was a position on his team that I want to interview. So that was about 23 years ago. Wow. And, um, yeah. So I was there for 11 years and now I've been with Columbia for 11. So, so, so it sounds like you're at the right, uh, right place at the right time to, to get that opportunity. Yes, definitely. So, so what did you learn out of the, uh, the catering and the event management yes. that you've brought to the table now in learning and development? Sure. So what I always say to people is if somebody comes and interviews with you and they say that they were an off-premise caterer for any period of time, hire them. Because I say that because I feel as though the resilience and the problem solving and the calm under pressure that you learn as an off-premise caterer, you can carry with you in any career if you're successful in doing it. Um, I mean, we were, I had parties in a snowstorm in a castle in Gloucester for the board of Shell Oil and we were supposed to have rack of lamb and the chef told me that he forgot the gas that, that made the oven work. So it was one of those things that, you know, go out in a snowstorm and find some propane. So I would say that I brought the idea of problem solving and the ability to push through and and um, to push through and uh, with my goals, I guess, is what, what I would say, to push through and make something happen, even if I feel like it might be insurmountable at the time. So So resilience is something that you've learned. Yes. But did you learn something in there about the experience that needs to be created for people? Because because I imagine, you know, with what you do now, you've got uh, some pretty demanding individuals that would be expecting a pretty good learning and development experience. So how does that come across, you know, in the, in, in the experience that you create? Definitely. So that's a really good point that I never really thought about, right? I never really thought about the fact that you create an experience. And that was one of my most favorite parts about catering was that I could take or we could take as a team an empty room or an empty tent and transform it into a beautiful 
um, event and just watch that transform in front of our eyes. And so likening that to learning and development, we take the blank slate and say, and we start from scratch and say, what are the needs of the people here at Columbia Threadneedle? What is it that they need to be successful? And how can we create that um, and bring that to life so that, that the folks that work with us have the tools that they need to be successful? And so what, what, you know, as the, as the leader of learning and development, what's the, what's the part, what's the role that you play or the, uh, the, the sort of the key function of it that, that, that you bring to the table? I mean, are you designing the training for them? Just the whole setup, the, the course curriculum, is that the part that you, you're getting into? What's so, the part yeah. of the experience that you, that is, is your, is your real domain? Yeah. So pretty much the whole thing. Um, so as the leader of the group, um, I was a one man show when I first arrived at Columbia and I came from a group of about 10. So that was on its own, just a huge learning experience. Um, and also when I started there, we had a very limited budget. So I was doing things on a shoestring. So then I was designing, um, creating, developing and facilitating pretty much all of the programs and really relying heavily on subject matter experts yeah. and, um, and using relationship building skills to, um, to cultivate trust with people and, and um, have them believe in what we were doing. So, yeah. So, we're, so, so were the subject matter experts internal in the firm? Internal in the firm. And I, I also relied heavily on external consultants with whom I formed good relationships back at my last job. And they, a couple of them turned into great mentors for me um, and helped me shape what I now have as um, a department of three of us at Columbia Threadneedle. Yeah, so it's bringing every, so really in a way, it's bringing, it's bringing the, whole, the whole thing together. Yes. And, the and, then, and then getting the right people in the right slots to uh, deliver maybe the uh, the intellectual knowledge that was needed mm -hmm. that you don't have. I mean, if you haven't yeah. been a, directly a fund manager, you can't, it's harder yeah. to teach people about that. Exactly, exactly. And I mean, the other thing that I think that I did when I came to Columbia Threadneedle was um, we weren't a learning culture when I came here. And there was a lot of resistance to learning and development. And um, I had leaders who, who are no longer at the company saying to me, can we do that before market and after market? Because these guys need to sell. And um, we had some leadership changes. And I feel like I was the little engine that could. And I just kept plugging away and plugging away and um, trying to advocate for the salespeople that we need to invest in their development in order for them to understand like that we value them and um, we'll be a better company as a whole if we um, provide this learning and development opportunities for them. And over, I'd say the last six years or so, we've really ramped things up and we have become a powerhouse learning culture at Columbia Threadneedle. And I have all of the leaders on board and they're huge advocates for, for what we do. So it's great. Yeah, it's a huge step because actually you took my next question out of my mouth um, <laughs> because I was going to ask you how, how you'd influence the culture. Yeah. So I feel as though, um, I mean, that's just it. So we went from a culture that, that devalued almost learning and development to a culture now that our national sales manager, because I do work primarily with the sales team, the intermediary distribution team, and a little bit with the institutional team, but that when we're at national sales meetings, our national sales manager makes learning and development a part of all of his keynote speeches now. And there's a couple of slides on what we're doing in learning and development, the importance of developing yourself and um, the success stories that we've had as a result of their development. Yeah. So, good. so well, that's a, that's a big shift because it's not easy to, to train that um, or to to get organizations to shift um, if the leadership particularly has been bottom line focused yes and not understanding the necessarily the need to invest in it yes yes 
So I'm sure you've had to be resilient in that in the, in the sales process to convince <laughs> uh, people up the line um, of, of, of the importance. Oh yes. But have you seen the results of the company has improved as well as you've as you've gone on that journey? I mean, I think that as a whole, our firm has come in the 10 years or 11 years that I've been there now, we are we are now seen as more of a powerhouse asset manager than we ever have in the past. And I'd like to think that the learning and development piece of it is a, is a piece of it. But I mean, our investment performance is amazing. Our leadership team is really strong. Um, we, we really function as a team. A couple of years back, we used to have these meetings. We still do. We had these meetings with all the leadership called alignment meetings. And we'd have someone from marketing or not someone, but representation from marketing, product, investment, and sales. And we get together twice a year to become aligned. And now we don't necessarily need those meetings anymore because we are aligned in the manner in which we work. So I think that it was just um, maybe if you want to call it like the perfect storm of leadership, of investment performance, of, of the alignment meetings and coming together and saying, all right, we're going to write the ship and we're going to all row in the same direction. And I think that that's what's happening now. Of course, you don't want to touch that culture. Um, yeah. At no. all. Once you've got it. Cause I, I know that, you know, I worked at Arthur Anderson many years ago. And the reason I went there when I was 21 years old coming out of university or college, as you call it here in America was because of the training. And there was a, there was a very heavy investment in training in that firm compared to its competitors at the time. Mm -hmm. But over time, the, the, the investment in it went down. Yeah. And I don't believe it affected performance straight away, but at a certain point it, it, it did. And that's why it's not there. You know, it's in my view, it's partly why it's not there today. Today. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and so it's easy, it's easy for the leadership teams to, uh, you know, when times get tough, to uh, to go into the learning budget and cut it cut it a bit. Mm-hmm. But in a way, it's a bit like cutting off your left or right hand or a, a foot. That's right. At some at some point, you're going to have a disability. That's right. And Ooh. and so uh, you know, I think. I think Rosemary, full marks to you for being strong enough to <laughs> uh, to see it through. Yeah. But also, you know, part of it is it's not it's not just the leaders saying, well, we need to have it, but you've got to make it a quality experience. Yes, definitely. And I mean, I do that. I think I do that by just constantly checking in with the leaders. And um, we've we've created something that we call the four pillars of learning and development. And every time I meet with the national sales manager, we go through and we say, where are we in each of those pillars and what are the needs? And then his leaders are very involved in the development of the programs that we are that we are delivering. And we also get a lot of feedback from the salespeople themselves and they tell us what they need. So um, it's a team effort. It's not just coming yeah. from me and pushed at them. And the other thing that I really, um, I, I do a lot of due diligence on the companies that I work with, the, the consultants with who I bring in because I look at them as an extension of me and my brand. And if I put someone in front of them who, who I don't really feel is credible, then that's, that's a ding on me. And yeah. so it's, it, it, it's can, it can, it, yeah, it can become a problem. Yeah. Um, Cause you don't get too many chances of getting it wrong. Uh, with, no. Particularly with the audience that you have. Mm-hmm. That's right. So, so just moving along, Rosemary, to your business DNA discovery that you did, and just for our for our listeners um, at DNA Behavior, we have everybody spend ten or twelve minutes online, and they answer some questions that uh, bring about uh, their 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 natural behavior style. And and so uh, for you, Rosemary, you're an influencer style, and uh, comes with the territory. You like to take charge and be quite outgoing, mm-hmm. um, and, and, and uh, uh, operate in a, you know in a spontaneous, flexible, intuitive way. I think that that comes out in your in the work that you do. You need to be intuitive to uh, get the room. So just tell me a little bit more about 
how you felt when you, when 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 um, the business DNA results came back to you, um, what the insights meant to you, how you've used it. Yeah. So first thing that came to my mind was a call that I made to Leon when as soon as I got the results, and I said, "Oh God, Leon." I don't think these are right. And he said, what do you mean? I said, because I didn't follow the directions. I was supposed to be like sequestered in my room and I was supposed to do this without any interruption. I took a couple of phone calls and a few people came into my office while I was doing the, uh, doing the, um, the assessment. And he said, well, no, your results tell me that, that that's probably something that happened. Right. So we laughed about it a little bit, but in, in um, ser all seriousness, Looking at the results, um, they, I, I wasn't very surprised at yeah. seeing the results. And what was your question about the results, how I'm using them? Yes, yeah, how you're using them, sort of, you know, your reaction to them. Um, yeah. People always have a standout for them, a standout insight, you know, and, and uh, yeah. with it usually. So I think the standout insight for me was um, the spontaneity piece. Of things, I mean, I'm I'm very. Um, it's one of the the strongest factors, I think, for me. Yeah. Um, the outgoing piece, I'm outgoing, right? So it's known. But the spontaneity piece for me really helped me to understand other people more so because it's so easy for me to switch gears. And what I learned from that is how frustrating that can be to others when I'm switching gears or when I'm interrupting their thought process and not allowing for them to like, I, I had somebody who worked for me, he, he was very planned and just seeing our results, it, the light bulb went off for me and I said, Oh my gosh. And it changed the course of our relationship and it yeah. changed the way that we interacted with one another. And it changed the way that I managed him because I wasn't giving him enough time to process and to think and to yeah. execute on his plan um, because I was not necessarily switching gears all the time, but thinking of another idea. I'm always brainstorming and then thinking of another idea instead of just tucking that brainstorm in and not sharing it straight away because of the outgoing piece. I would just blurt it out and he would think that he would have to act on it. And then I would say, oh, no, no, I'm just I'm just sharing the ideas. So it really helped our relationship and it helped me to understand how to manage him better. Yeah, I think that's the power of uh, the reports that when you can share it with somebody else and see see that difference in the and the, and the penny drops. Yeah. Okay, this is potentially where we've been mm -hmm. uh, butting heads or the energy has been a bit negative. Yeah. But I always, you know, say to everybody that being spontaneous is to be celebrated and it's... Um, you know, it's a very important trait, particularly in in today's world where everybody needs to be adaptable. Yeah. You know, and, and so adaptability comes from people like you who are spontaneous and creative. Mm -hmm. um, but the gift is the the in, being intuitive. But I think, and I'm saying this for the benefit of the audience as well, uh, Rosemary, you can be uh, uh Whilst it's going with the flow, you can at times for, for a planned person at least be too fluid. Yes, definitely. And, and I can see that. And just knowing my nature has helped me so much to keep that in check a little bit, if you will. But but not really squelching the creativity piece because as a facilitator, I feel like my intuition and my spontaneity helps me to understand what's happening in the room and to yeah. adjust on the fly. So if I feel like the energy of the class is going in this direction, but you know, my next, um, my next piece of the curriculum was over here. I don't go there. I stay here with them. And um, I think that that's beneficial for my learners. Yeah. I think that someone who is uh, spontaneous is able to capture the, get, get the energy in the room, be intuitive, probably quicker than someone planned mm -hmm. um, but the fact is we've all got the gift yeah but but uh um the the planned person will be thinking about it a lot longer it'll take it'll take them a bit longer to get there um, mm -hmm. with that so that is but that's something that's important to creating the experience is to is to understand what people are 
you know, a feeling in the room and, you know, does it, does the program need to be tweaked or adjusted? Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, the structure needs to be maintained as well. So having someone planned on your team is also good yeah. to, keep, to keep stability in the structure um, and to make sure every, all the, everything turns up on time that's supposed to turn up on time, including, oh, yeah. uh, including the propane gas. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, it's so funny because I just hired someone new on my team and I knew her DNA. She, she came from the sales desk. And one of the things that I said to Katerina, who's on my team, who's an adapter, I said, we need someone on our team who is very organized and very planned because that will help to round out our team. And the person who I just hired is very organized and very planned. So it's, it's, I'm excited to have her on the team. And we just had our first meeting today and just talking to her and hearing some of her ideas, like this is going to be good. No, it's very important for the team, I think, to have someone like that who can create the stability. And then in a way you create the, uh, the, ex the excitement, the pizzazz, um, the experience for the participants so that they yeah. feel, um, you know, it's a great event. And, 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 and as you said, you can make that out of nothing uh, yeah. uh, when you want to. So, so if we take that, if we take all that forward and also your, you know, your life in, 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 um, in catering, <laughs> and sort of look at it in terms of Rosemary's identity, your, you know, your unique gift, how you want to be seen in the world. Where does the plane land on that for you? Ha, huh, that's a good question because a lot of, a lot of my identity, I mean, some of my identity definitely comes from work, right? Cause I'm yep. here a lot. Um, but a lot of it comes from outside of work and the things that I do outside of work. Yeah. Um, so I, um, I have a commitment to something that's called the Pan Mash Challenge, which is a bike ride across Massachusetts that raises money for cancer. So every time I talk about that, I cry because it's so important to me. But um, so I've been doing that for 17 years. So that's a big piece of who I am. And um, I in the last five years, I've got my couple of my nephews and my brother and my brother's firm involved in doing that. So that's a big piece of me. And then there's another piece. I became a yoga teacher back in 2006. And then again, I, I continued to go through yoga training until about 2015 as teacher training. And I was a teacher for maybe five or six years part time. Um, so that's another big piece of who I am. So I think you know, if I put it all together and I look at it all in one um, clump of clay, if you will, yeah. um, I think that it would be somebody who um, who is a champion of the development of others yeah. and is a champion of um, not even just the development of others, but of celebration of others, if you will. And I mean of myself too, but I tend to, uh, it tends to be, I tend to try to bring the positive aspects of life to other people to show them, hey, your life could be better if you embrace this. So, But I, but I think that's, that is what, that's what the identity is about in, in, in the sense that, you know, if I pull that together, that championing the celebration of others happens through the training work that you're doing. Yeah through the yoga and also, you know, through the, uh, through the bicycle riding, whether it's the bicycle riders themselves or, or the, you know, the, the charity itself. Yeah. Um, you know, you're championing uh, the, the celebration of, of, of other people and of life. Yeah. Um, uh, through that. And, and there's probably something in there where you're creating experiences for people in those environments as well. You're not just doing it at, at work, your your yeah. your there's probably some fun experience people are getting in the bike riding um, trips that they're doing. Oh yeah, and the yoga. Yes. Oh, definitely, definitely. So, so there's I mean, something I, there's something there's something within you that you're doing that's that's making it a celebration. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Oh, it makes perfect sense. And I mean, I think that when I think about everything all together um what moves me to my core is just really the power of the human spirit and the, the power of the human spirit of people 
coming together to conquer something larger than themselves, whether that be at work or whether that be in your personal life or whether that be, you know, in your family or the, through the charity work that you do, but just um, that together we're so much stronger and together we can accomplish so much more. See, I think they've taken, I think you've taken this uh, a step further just now by, by, you know, using the words, by helping people, um, conquer something that's bigger than themselves. Yeah. And, and, and it's probably getting people to celebrate that when, they, when, when they've done it. Yeah, yeah. And, again, that would, that would, um, that would happen in the learning and that would happen uh, bike, in the bike riding experience and the yoga. Definitely. Yeah, all of them are definitely tied together. And do you think it's your... Do you think it's your relationship building skill, your communication that does that? Uh, mm. Your intuition. Do you, what, what, what do you think triggers that to happen? Because the resilience yeah. side of you is a little different. Yeah. I'm not sure that triggers that. I don't think so either. I think it's more the intuition coupled with, I think the intuition is the probably the strongest piece of it because it's almost like you can feel what somebody you can't really feel what somebody else is feeling, obviously, yeah. but you can get a good idea of it and you can have an attunement with other people. Um, so I feel as though maybe it's the intuition piece of things coupled with the relationship building. Yeah. Because those two go hand in hand, really. Yeah, so you're using your intuition and relationship building skills in a lot of ways or talents mm-hmm. to help people conquer something that's larger than themselves and celebrate it. Yes. So that's that that to me is what your identity uh, is all about, Rosemary. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah, I think it's very cool. And I think that's part that 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 that's something that, you know, is is uh, you reinforce the training you know, the need for powerhouse training inside Columbia Threadneedle, that's part of what you're wanting to happen is for people to conquer something bigger than themselves, whether it's when they're doing their work there or, in, in fact, in their own lives um, yeah. and, and generally speaking and then obviously in the other environments that you're, that you're, um, that you're living in. Yeah. yeah. I think that, that that makes perfect sense. So... So I think we've, uh, we've, we've come a long way today. And, and um, so as we wrap up, is there anything else that you would like to share with the audience? Any, any, any kind of tip, thoughts? Um, I just feel closing like... Closing remark of some sort? Yeah. Well, I mean, just for, for DNA behavior and looking at um, how much it has helped our firm. And it's really helped me as a leader and it's helped other leaders in my firm. Um, is just to really celebrate our differences and to yeah. understand that the, the power of differences and the power of, um, of different views or even ways of doing something and embracing that because that, that's really what um, DNA behavior has taught me. And it's helped so much in my understanding of not only myself, but others on the team. And a lot of times people will come to me and they'll say, you know, Hugh da, 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 is doing this. And I'll say, oh, well, you know what? He's an initiator. And this is, you know, this is something he's really driven. And so it's not about you. It's about, you know, just the way that he is in the world or, or you know, something along those lines. And people say, ah, now that makes sense. So. Because it's really is, it, you know, as we wrap up, it's the, to me, it's the holy grail of leadership is to be able to manage differences. And yeah. It, it's, I think to know that they're there is one step of it, but to really be able to manage them uh, on a regular basis and do a good job of it is not very easy. No. But it's the key to, uh, it's the key to success. Yeah. And just one more little thing. It's funny yeah. because I have about, I don't know, 250 people or so at my firm and I can almost remember all of their DNA and everybody says, how do you do that? And I just find it so fascinating. To me, it's one of those things that is, um, it's so powerful and it's just so interesting to the more that you know about somebody and the more that you understand them, 
the the better the relationship is going to be over time. So well, to me, that shows that you love what you're doing. And yeah, uh, yeah I, 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 I've, I've commented to people, I've found it amazing how many of how many of the ones that I've touched in our firm, and of course, I don't touch the same percentage of them as I did at the start, which was nearly 100%. Uh, yeah. It's very low now, but I remember I remember them all when I've, when I've met the person and, and, and seen the style. Um, it yeah. never goes away. It's um, crazy. Yeah, and you keep that MRI scan in your head, but, but, it's a, it, but it's a wonderful gift to have. Yeah, yeah, it is. So thank you. No, it's a pleasure. Well, Rosemary, thank you so much. And, and it's great to uh, spend time with you and learn more about your identity. And I think a lot more people are going to be uh, conquering the mountain and, and celebrating. <laughs> great. Thanks so much, Hugh. That's a pleasure.